everyone. I hope you're having a lovely DjangoCon. My name is Nina. I've been writing code professionally for over a decade now. I've worked at some companies you might have heard of, like HBO, Meetup, Reddit. These days, I work at Microsoft as a cloud developer advocate. That means that my goal is to make the Python experience on Azure a pleasure for Python developers everywhere. That right there is our mascot, Bit. If you think he's cute, please find me after the talk. I have lots of stickers to give away. And today, we're going to talk about code review skills for Pythonistas. The slides are available online at the link up above. Uh, grab a copy to follow along if you'd like to, share with your coworkers. There's lots of links in the slides um, and helpful resources. Quick show of hands, uh, how many people here have been part of a code review? OK, almost everyone. Now, how many of you have only had a positive experience with code reviews? Three people. <laughs> I want to talk to you after this. <laughs> um, OK, so not many. And my goal today is to change that. So after this talk, you're going to know how to make the code review process one that's positive and productive. Let's try something fun during this talk. Uh, if you're on Twitter, if you're learning something new, if you're excited about something you've heard today, please go ahead and share a tweet. The hashtag for this conference is DjangoCon. You can at mention me. My username is NNJA. Now, to briefly cover what we're going to talk about today, I want to tell you what the proven benefits of code review are. And those are going to be based on research and on case studies. We're going to talk about setting standards. I'm going to go over some tools with you that are going to make the review process a lot better and easier for Python developers with automation, because everybody likes it when their job is easier. I'm going to give you specific examples of how to be an effective reviewer and a submitter, how to submit your PRs for maximum impact. And lastly, I'm going to share how to use those tools to build a much stronger team. What will you take away from this talk? If you're a complete beginner, you're going to have a comprehensive overview of code review best practices. If you're intermediate, you're going to learn about tooling and automation. If you're a total pro, you're going to learn about the hardest part, and that's the people factor. Remember that this talk is not one size fits all. I'm offering you suggestions here. You need to adjust them based on your own work situation. There's some factors here like team size. Taking the time to review will affect a team of two much greater than a team of 10. Your product type makes a difference. If you're in an agency, you might have uh, tighter deadlines. You might have more of an incentive to just try to push code out the door. Um, and if you're working on open source, that's also a big factor. When your coworkers, um, you have a lot more motivation to work together. If you're working on open source, the rules are just a little bit different. Uh, a paycheck really offers incentive that's hard to compete with. And you might have some friction there uh, because of things like language barriers, differing time zones. It's also not one size fits all because of defect tolerance. What is a defect tolerance? It's the rate of failure that's acceptable in your software. If you're dealing with something like a cell phone game, you have a high defect tolerance. If the phone game crashes, whatever, who cares, right? But you'll have low tolerance if you're writing software for something like medical equipment or an airplane, because um, you might get zapped in a, in, a, in a medical machine if your code's not thoroughly reviewed and tested. And, uh, someone laughed, but that this is true. This, this happened in the, in the course of software development. Um, and code reviews can seem really frustrating on the surface. Um, just, I mean, look at this developer. She's so angry that she's eating her laptop. <laughs> code reviews um, shouldn't be this frustrating. We don't want that to be us. Some of those apparent frustrations People think it might add a time demand. That can be especially noticeable on smaller teams. It adds process, and everyone hates process, right? It can bring up some team tensions. I mean, reviews can bring up egos, personality incompatibilities, um, can flare up some of those hidden tensions between team members. And lastly, every once in a while, we'll just run into a really smart dev who thinks that their code is just too good to be reviewed. 
How do you change these attitudes? You need to start by selling the benefits. In the short term, it's true. Frustrations and slowdowns are inevitable. But like with all things, the more you practice, the more velocity you'll have over time, the better you'll get. The biggest benefit, though, is that you're going to find bugs and you're going to find design flaws. They can be found and fixed before the code is done. There have been multiple case studies from IBM, AT&T, Microsoft that have shown that code review can lower the bug rate by up to 80%, and it can increase productivity by up to 15%. Because at the end of the day, the goal is to find those bugs before your customers do. Reviews also help us feel a sense of shared ownership and shared knowledge throughout the team. We're in this together. No developer becomes the only expert because everyone gains familiarity with different parts of the code base by participating in reviews. Why is it important that no single developer is the only expert? We call this the lottery factor. It's a measurement of how much concentrated specialized knowledge belongs to individual team members. Miguel, this tweet is about Miguel. He works for the New York City transit system. And when the subway vending machines go down, he's the only person that knows how to reboot the system. <laughs> There's a problem here because his commute home takes three hours and he turns his cell phone off during that commute. That's bad enough, but what happens if Miguel wins the lottery tomorrow and decides that he never wants to work another day in his life? That's a huge problem. That's the lottery factor. Will one person completely sabotage this project if they left tomorrow? So the benefits of code review, we find bugs. We do so before our customers do. We share ownership in the product. We share knowledge about our code. We reduce that dreaded lottery factor. We need to encourage consistency here because at the end of the day, the code isn't yours. It actually belongs to your company. That means that your code needs to fit your company's style guides and standards and not your own, or your project's style guides and standards, not your own. So what reviews do is encourage consistency, and that makes the code more robust because, let's be real, nobody stays at a company forever. Code longevity is really an important factor. Code reviews need to be universal and they need to follow guidelines. Doesn't matter how junior or senior you are, everybody on the team should be submitting and reviewing code. If only senior developers are doing code review, that's actually a huge bottleneck on your team. I worked uh, with a developer in a Java shop who insisted on formatting his code C++ style instead of Java style. So there's a little bit of a difference in terms of where the braces go for the opening function. In Java, it's on the same line. In C++, it's on the new line. And this caused some nightmare diffs, as you can imagine, and a lot of frustration amongst the team who was maintaining his code. When I protested, I was told, well, you know what, that's OK. He's allowed to do that. He's the most senior engineer, and that's fine. And some of you are kind of shaking your heads, but it's a true story. And special cases like this, inequality, it really breeds dissatisfaction. Nobody should be special in this process. So how do we do all of this? Well, let's jump right in. A style guide. A style guide is what distinguishes personal taste from opinion. And many of you might be thinking, well, we have PEP8. Isn't that good enough? Not really. PEP8 only scratches the surface. It only offers some suggestions. Whatever Whatever style guide you choose, it should be agreed upon beforehand. Google has a lengthy one, for example. Uh, it goes through the pros and cons of every decision made. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Just pick one, stick with it. Because great code bases look like they were written by an individual when actually they were worked on by a team. And a style guide helps enforce that. Python has some other useful tools that help with this process called formatters. Auto PEP 8 is the least strict. It just formats your code to adhere to PEP 8. Black is brand new, and it's my personal favorite. It's the uncompromising Python formatter. It has almost no configuration options, so there's no room for disagreement. <laughs> Basically, you pick a line length, and that's it. YAPF, which stands for yet another Python formatter, if you're seeing a theme, 
Um, it's very configurable. It even allows you to specify a style guide to follow. Uh, there's a really cool demo of Black written by Jose Padilla. Check it out after my talk, of course, for those of you who have your laptops open and you could see what formatting options Black might take on your current code. Um, there's also really amazing support for Black in my favorite editor, VS Code. If you don't know what VS Code is, it's a free open source editor with amazing Python support. It's cross-platform, runs on Linux, Mac, Windows. In order to set up Black in VS Code, you need to install the Python extension, pip install Black, update a handful of settings, and that's it. You can then use VS Code to format your code with Black on save. Maybe Bob wasn't in the wrong. Maybe, in fact, C++ style formatting is, in, is better, but the problem was he wasn't following convention. Consistent code will be a lot easier to maintain by a team. Code review also needs to be done by your peers and not by management, because the end goal is not to get in trouble. Bugs found during code review should never come up in the performance review process. That's why we're doing code reviews in the first place. And to add on that, don't point fingers. Maintain a no-blame culture. When the team reviews code, the team becomes responsible for code quality, not just an individual. This really needs support for management if you work in an organization, because if you get in trouble for sharing your mistakes, you're just going to brush them under the rug next time. You won't be able to learn from them. To support your teammates here, it's not a competition. When code reviews become this really positive process, developers aren't going to dread it. They're going to want their code reviewed. They're going to be excited about the process. It's not just going to be something that they have to do every day. Code review fundamentals, they need to be done by your peers. Style guides and formatters help encourage consistency. Maintain a healthy, no-blame culture. How do we do code reviews? There's two sides of this coin. For effective reviews, we need to learn not just how to be a great submitter, but also how to be a great reviewer. I love this comic here. On the left, the person is saying, there's no need to double check these changes. If some problems remain, the reviewer will catch them. Person on the right, no need to look at these changes too closely. I'm sure the author knows what he's doing. <laughs> you need to be really careful not to get rubber stamped. What is rubber stamping? It's when the submitted code is so complex, the reviewer thinks that it's obvious that the author knows what they're doing. They just rubber stamp, approved, approve the code without fully understanding it. Don't be too clever. Readability really counts. Submitting over complicated code is a surefire way of getting that rubber stamp. I have a developer friend who used to love showing off how smart he was by checking in all these complex over-engineered solutions. He stopped doing it when he realized that he was punishing himself. It meant that he always ended up being the maintainer of that code. Once he came to that realization, he stopped flexing and started writing maintainable code. Remember, readability counts. I think Russ Olson said it best here. Good code is like a good joke. It needs no explanation. If you feel like a piece of code is confusing, it is. Leave a comment, either in code or in your review tool. Better yet, refactor it so that it's more readable and understandable. I find the process of submitting code reviews a little bit easier to think about when I think about it in stages, ranging from before I even submit the pull request to after the review has been completed. At stage zero, we're before submission, what kinds of things do we need to think about before we even think about starting the review? The most important thing, provide the context, the why. This helps the reviewer a lot. Why did you write this line of code? Link to any underlying issues or tickets, like a bug report that would give more context. If there's not enough ticket in that context, provide more. I, I'm sorry, if there's not enough context in that ticket, provide more. Document why the change was needed. For larger PRs, you can even provide a change log. And remember to point out any unintended side effects your code might have. Remind yourself that you are the primary reviewer. 
before submitting, you want to review your code as if you were giving someone else a code review. Before I submit my PR, um, sometimes I'll look at it again in the context of a GitHub diff, and sometimes I'll see new issues crop up. There's just something about that context which that gives me a new perspective. This lets you anticipate any problem areas before the reviewer does. As the primary reviewer, it's your responsibility to make sure that your code works, that it's thoroughly tested. You always QA your own changes because you don't want to rely on someone else to catch your mistakes. Before submitting, you can also try a checklist. What makes a good checklist? Check off the small stuff. Did you check for reusable code or utility methods, libraries? Did you remove any debugger, debugger statements? Uh, if you don't have pre-commit hooks set up, that might be something that you check for. Are your commit messages clear and understandable? You can also check for the big stuff. Is your code secure? Is it going to scale? Is it maintainable? Is it resilient against outages? For this process, I highly recommend a book called The Checklist Manifesto. It's pretty short. It's a book about how having checklists help doctors make surgery safer, helped uh, pilots fly sa planes safely, and guess what? Checklists can help developers too. We made it to stage one. We've submitted the review. At this point, you're starting a conversation. Don't get too attached to your code before the review even starts. Anticipate comments, anticipate feedback, and acknowledge that you're probably going to make a few mistakes. Remember, the entire point of a review is to find problems, and problems will be found. So don't be caught by surprise here. Stage two is optional, is submitting a work in progress pull request. When might you want to do that? As a rule of thumb, if you're working on something big and complex, when your code is about 30 to 50% done, this uh, drives perfectionists crazy, right? But you can't be afraid of showing incomplete incremental work here. It's hard to just let that go, let go of the desire to make everything beautiful and perfect, but that's not what a work in progress pull request is about. When code is a work in progress, good types of feedback to get here are architect architectural issues, overall design problems, uh, suggestions for design patterns, you really want this feedback, this type of feedback, before you approach being done. It'll save you a lot of time. You don't need to rewrite a finished product. Feedback at this stage early and often helps the process a lot. Stage three, we're almost done. We can see the finish line, it's so close. The type of feedback that we prefer to get at this point, nitpicks, variable names, maybe some requests for more documentation or comments, any other small optimizations. As the code evolves, it should, be, should become more firm. No one wants to hear, change it all at this stage. If you did, it means you've had some sort of breakdown in communication. The, this kind of process prevents wasting time and effort for bigger, more complex pull requests. At this point, you also want to ask yourself, did I solve one issue with my pull request? If you solve multiple problems, you want to break up your code into multiple pull requests. This will really help the reviewer. If you solved an unrelated problem, make a new PR with a separate diff. Uh, you can even make a branch of your code from a feature branch, and this will help keep that other diff small. We want to keep reviews small because they help reviewer burnout. Some case studies have shown that reviews, uh, reviewers become less effective when they look at more than 500 lines of code in a session. Keep it small, keep it relevant. If a big review is unavoidable, consider giving the reviewer some extra time. You can also use automated tools and static analysis to help streamline the review process. First and most importantly, a linter. Hopefully, you all have linting set up for your Python projects. If you don't, it's the first thing that you should do when you leave this talk. What is code linting? It's an automated way of checking syntax. Or if you want to get fancy, you can set it up to check style guide violations, too. Here's an example of some linter output. A linter can integrate with your code editor. 
any editor that edits Python supports this. And this way, the reviewer doesn't have to waste any of their own time pointing out syntax errors. PyLint is a great linting option for Python. There's lots and lots of configuration options, integrations, coding standards, error detection, refactoring help, editor integration. Make sure you take the time to learn your linter and its configuration options. I'll show you one of my favorite PyLint rules. I don't know if any of you have done this, but it's kind of a common gotcha for me. I'm refactoring out parameter arguments, copying and pasting them, and I end up with a trailing comma. It's really hard to notice, but there's a trailing comma after bar, after the assignment to bar. And what that does is make bar a tuple instead of an integer. And this causes vague errors, test failures. It's a little bit non-obvious. Tracking down this sort of bug, if you don't have any type hinting enabled in your project, it, has, it just has messed up my day multiple times. Pilot comes to the rescue here. There's a rule, trailing comma tuple. You can set it up and catch this sort of stuff. You can use vulture.py to find unused and unreadable, unreachable code in Python using static code analysis. This doesn't work so well when the call code is called via introspection. And because Python is dynamic, Vulture can make mistakes. So it's really good practice to double check the results. When used correctly, it can really help keep a code base clean. Here's an example of Vulture. We have some code here. We have three methods, foo, bar, baz. We are only calling foo and bar. When we run Vulture on this file, it will tell us with 60% confidence that the function baz is unused. That's pretty cool. Git pre-commit hooks allow you to short circuit a commit and make checks before the code even reaches your repository. You can do things here like run a linter, check your syntax, check for to-dos, debugger statements, unused imports, any other stuff that litters up your code. You can enforce styling here with auto pep a or the black formatter. There's even an option to completely reject the commit if conditions aren't met. Sounds great, right? It also sounds like a lot of work, and we developers are pretty lazy. Thankfully, someone else has set up a great tool for us. It's called pre-commit.com. If you don't want to write your own pre-commit hooks, it's an amazing library with lots of resources available. It's written in Python. And it gives really nice, well-formatted command line output. Extra nice here, you can test your hooks without actually trying to commit, which becomes really tedious when you're writing pre-commit hooks from scratch. It supports a few nice hooks for Python. We got auto pep8 to run pep8 on your source, flake8, pyflakes, check AST to check if the file contains valid Python, debug statements to check for debugger statements. I don't believe there's support for black, the black formatter just yet. So if anybody has the time and wants to contribute that back, please do. And there are a lot more hooks that aren't Python specific, like trimming trailing white space, checking for files that have merge conflict strings in them, verifying your JSON. Lots of time saving features here. Tests, there are tons of talks about tests. So I'm gonna touch on them very briefly. Write them, please. <laughs> Tests need to be passing for somebody new to be able to meaningfully contribute to your project. And tests help you identify problems immediately. Nobody wants to work with scumbag programmer who commits untested code. He's, he's a bad guy. <laughs> Continuous integration. What is it? It's an automated build with every push. You can run your linter, run your tests. Lots of available tools here. CPython uses Azure DevOps pipelines. There's also Travis, CircleCI. The cool thing about Azure DevOps uh, pipelines is that they support multiple platforms, Mac, Linux, and Windows. There are lots of, um, lots of these tools are free for small teams or open source projects. All of them integrate with GitHub pull requests, so you'll see some nice output like that right in your PR. 
Coverage helps too. What is coverage? It's the percent of code that's executed when a test suite runs. It gauges the effectiveness of your tests. Coverage.py is a great tool. It can generate nice HTML reports. Um, remember we talked about fault tolerance earlier in the talk. If you have a low fault tolerance, for example, if your software runs in a nuclear power plant, your coverage should be close to 100%. Coverage tools also integrate into GitHub. There's um, coverage.py, there's coveralls.io. Automation in this space saves everyone time. Now we're at the last stage. Our review is complete. The reviewer has finished looking at your code. We're still not done, though. At this stage, we need to remember to be responsive. Don't just ignore any comments that were left. Respond to them, even if you don't agree with them, um, and especially if you decide not to implement that suggestion. Make sure you come to some mutual agreement with the reviewer if you decide not to, not to go ahead with their suggestion. If there are any comments, let the reviewer know that you've pushed changes when your code is ready to be reviewed. It's still a conversation. But don't bike shed. What is bike shedding? It's when you're arguing over really minor issues while more serious ones are being overlooked. For example, people arguing about what color to paint the bike shed when the house isn't even done. If you're going back and forth about something more than three times, step away from the keyboard, use your words. Don't forget to record the result of that conversation in the pull request to maintain context for anyone else who might be looking at it later. Bikeshed.com, you want to learn more about bike shedding. If you're co-located, that's great. You can just walk over to the other person's desk for a conversation. If not, a tool that I really like is VS Code Live Share. It's an extension for VS Code. It allows real-time sharing between two VS Code instances. You keep your own editor, your own fonts, your own themes, most importantly, your own keyboard shortcuts, because I'm not looking to start you know, uh, VI versus Emacs editor wars. We just want to collaborate. You can edit collaborative, uh, collaboratively, but navigate independently, and you don't need to learn anything new. Super cool for remote teams. Takes a lot of pain out of the process. There's a link to download the extension in my slides. If you disagree with the reviewer's comments, no radio silence here. Try to carefully explain what the reviewer might have missed. Open a friendly discussion until you understand why the reviewer left the comment. It's possible the reviewer missed some of your thought process, but maybe you're just wrong. It happens to the best of us. When you're wrong, that's OK. Learn to gracefully accept defeat. Don't take any of this feedback personally. Think about it as an opportunity for growth. Admitting that you don't know something is really hard. It can be a great way to trigger imposter syndrome that's present in many of us. Don't take it personally. You are not your code. Use it as an opportunity to grow. Remember, we're all working towards the same goal. It's to ship code. And be grateful that someone took the time to review your code. Offer thanks if you can. How do we be a great submitter? We provide context. We review our own code first. We expect a conversation. And we submit work in progress PRs when necessary. We use automated tools to help us. We're responsive. And when necessary, we learn to gracefully accept defeat. We talked, spent a lot of time talking about how to be a great submitter. Let's cover the other side of the story. How do we be a good reviewer? I love this comic, too. The therapist asks, why do you think you're so hostile in code reviews? And the dev laments, if only I had been more popular in high school. Code reviews should not look like an appointment with your therapist. You need to approach them objectively and without ego. Leave some of those emotions behind. Have empathy towards others. There should be no room for hostility here. Have empathy towards yourself, too. Check in before you start. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you angry? Maybe you're dehydrated or tired. 
check in with yourself. Do you, you know, if you need it, have some water, have some coffee, take a walk, come back to it. Because remember that all of these feelings can affect the review process. Take care of yourself. Be objective during the review. You can say something like, I noticed that this method is missing a doc string instead of you forgot to write the doc string. Reviews are a learning opportunity, not a chance to catch someone else being wrong. This type of phrasing really helps from keeping it personal. Try to ask some questions instead of giving answers. Would it make more sense if we did it this way? Did you think about trying this other approach? Offer suggestions. You can say things like, it might be easier to, or we tend to do it this way instead, because suggestions are better than ultimatums. Avoid these terms, always. Simply, easily, just, obviously. If it was so obvious, the submitter wouldn't have done it in the first place. They might be missing context. They might be unaware of a concept. Especially avoid this one. Well, actually. <laughs> Don't say it. It's something that you might say when something or someone is mostly right, but you feel like you need to interrupt them with a very minor correction. Usually it's not worth it. I recommend reading the Recurse Center for this gem and many more. Uh, Recurse Center social rules for this gem and many more. I'm not sure if any of you practice yoga. I do occasionally, and this happens in my class all the time. The teacher will somehow twist herself into a pretzel, and then she'll just tell the class to now simply put your feet behind your head. A few of you would consider this simple. I mean, I certainly don't, I, but that looks hard. So remember this uncomfortable little guy when you start saying one of those words. To be effective, you really need to have clear feedback. Your opinions need to be strongly supported. You need to share the how and why, why you think this change is necessary, how you might go along with the implementation. Link to blogs, documentation, other resources that back up your opinions. And don't feign surprise if someone doesn't know something, even if you consider it a basic concept, like, you know, gasp, I can't believe that Dave doesn't know about the singleton pattern design pattern. Cut down on the snark and innuendos. This isn't the time or the place. Reviews can bring up a lot of emotions for both sides, so be cognizant of that. Also, make sure you stay away from critical emoji-only feedback. If you leave a thumbs-down emoji and no comment, it's not a great call. Something like this is not clear feedback. <laughs> Remember to compliment good work and great ideas. I like to leave a thumbs up when I see something like a great refactoring, a particularly clean solution, something really elegant, because reviews shouldn't be all about the bad. For large reviews with a lot of comments, consider leaving at least one compliment. And you don't want to be a perfectionist. This tweet says it a lot better than I can. The goal is better code, not exactly the code that I would have written. For big issues, don't let perfect get in the way of perfectly acceptable. Prioritize what's important to you. Usually 90, 95% of the way there is good enough. When you press for complete perfectionism, you end up taking ownership away from the person who wrote the code. It takes their feelings of accomplishment and creativity away. But. It's also okay to nitpick things like syntax issues, spelling errors, poor variable names, missing corner cases. Save those nitpicks for last. You might ask, what's the harm in letting some of these pass by? Well, it's the broken window theory. If I see sloppy code, I assume it's okay to check in sloppy code too. You, at this point, you need to specify if your nitpicks are blocking merge or not. As a PR submitter, I think of nitpicks as a compliment. If the rest of your code is so well written that the small stuff sticks out, you did a great job. Don't burn out as a reviewer. Those case studies have shown that you should look at about two to 400 lines of code at a time for maximum impact. 
In practice, reviewing between two and 400 lines of code within a 1690 window, uh, 90 minute window will let you find about 70 to 90% of the bugs. If 10 bugs exist in your code, a properly conducted review would find between seven and nine of them. After 500 lines of code, those studies have shown that the ability to find bugs drops dramatically. If the code stops making sense, you're probably tired. You might need to take a break. You might miss something. A good rule of thumb, if you work in a company, try to do those reviews within 24 to 48 hours after they're submitted. This is especially easy when those reviews are small. This lets you look at those reviews incrementally, prevents buildup. It also means that the code is fresh in the submitter's mind for questions. Obviously, this rule is, uh, oh, I said obviously. Shame on me. It's not obvious. But a good rule of thumb is to be flexible for open source projects. Try to keep, at least respond within 48 to 72 hours if you can, because it helps keep excitement and momentum up. You don't want to end up like this guy just who's still waiting and waiting and waiting for code review. So how can we be a great reviewer? We have empathy. We watch our language. We have clear feedback. We give compliments for good work. We're not perfectionists about the project, about the process. We avoid reviewer burnout. We finish those reviews as soon as possible, and we don't leave people hanging. This, this is not just anecdotes. I've become a much stronger engineer by giving and receiving code reviews, especially at a company that had a great review culture. I used it as an opportunity to learn from others. I started anticipating what a reviewer might point out before even getting to the review process. Code reviews sound like hard work, and they are. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But now you know what to do to reap the rewards. You can use this as a huge advantage when somebody new joins. Sasha said it best during her talk on giving and getting technical help. She said, hiring sen senior engineers is hard. We all know that. Instead, you can hire junior engineers, and you can grow them into, your functional and, uh, into a functional and productive part of your team. Code reviews are an absolutely fantastic way of doing that. If you're not doing code reviews, you're missing a huge opportunity. They're provably shown to improve code quality against, across all kinds of organizations, all kinds of code bases. Think about what's blocking your team from trying out some of the techniques I told you about today and figure out ways of eliminating those blockers. Remember, allocate the time, develop, don't force the process. Code reviews are not a one-stop fix. You need to use them in addition to tests, QA, and other kinds of methods for maximum impact. What did we learn? My coworker, Sarah Drasner, she said that coworkers who are good at code review are worth their weight in gold. I 100% agree with her. And the most important thing, we learned that code reviews decrease WTFs per minute, which is the only valid measurement of code quality. That's a fact. We all want to work with the team on the left and not with the team on the right. Less WTFs lead to much happier developers. If you want to check, if you want to learn more about what I work on at Microsoft, check out the link bit.ly slash Python Azure. My slides are available for download at bit.ly slash Django code reviews. There are tons of links to additional resources here, including a link to my blog post about the top three gotchas to look out for when you're code reviewing Django applications, and uh, some links to examples, code styles, lots of great things in there. If you have comments, questions, feedback, if you agree with me, or if you disagree with me, please send me a message on Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much.